Good afternoon. Welcome to EAU podcast. Today we are going to provide you an update of the upper tract uh, urothelia cancer guidelines that have just released uh, very, very recently. My name is Paolo Gontero. I'm the chair of the Non-Muscle Invasive Bladder Cancer Guidelines, and I have the pleasure to run this conversation with Professor Mas Alexandra Masolecon, who is actually in charge of the YouTube guidelines. Welcome, Alexandra. And so I think that uh, we, we have to try to highlight what are the main points uh, of change for our guidelines this year in 2024. And uh, I think we should start from uh, the fact that uh, YouTube is more and more something that we have to view as a genetic disease. What have been the, the changes in this respect? Yes, Paolo, thank you for this question. It's absolutely true um, that some of uh, UTUCs are related to Lynch syndrome. And unfortunately, um, the Lynch syndrome-related UTUCs are, are clearly underdiagnosed. So there are a lot of patients that are actually in a genetic context that will never get a genetic screening. So it's not always easy for the readers uh, to pinpoint, to see between two guidelines, there are very big guidelines, what has changed but uh, there has been quite a lot of changes in the genetic paragraph. Um, last year, 2023, what was said was that um, you were supposed to screen during the medical interview the patient to see if there was some genetic background in the family or uh, if he had previous cancers uh, relating on what we call modified Amsterdam criteria. And then it was said that if for any reason the patient had some testing for uh, mismatch repair deficiency on the radical nephroureter esterine specimen, then the patient should go on for genetic counseling. But we are not giving any recommendation about whether or not this testing has to be done. So this has changed in the 2024 um, guidelines. We have now uh, made the statement with a weak strength of recommendation because we are lacking actually literature on uh, how this would be uh, clinically significant for the, uh, for the treatment of the patient, but we have made this weak recommendation to offer systematically a screening on the radical nephroureterectomy specimen. So that means that once the patient has RNU, there are two ways to screen, either uh, using immunohistochemistry, so the pathologist looks for mismatch repair protein deficiency using immunohistochemistry, or um, looking directly from microsatellite instability using PCR, which are the uh, two available techniques. And so if uh, there are signs, molecular signs of uh, um, microsatellite instability, then the patient should go to germline testing. So we are moving a little bit uh, further. We don't have a lot of evidence to recommend it. That's why it's weak. But we now suggest that if possible, any patient should be offered some testing on the RNU specimen. Yes, maybe I think that uh, to our uh, readers, probably this uh, may seem uh, to push too much uh, towards uh, genetic testing, but I think that probably we need uh, to make sure that this message that YouTube has to be considered a genetic disease uh, needs to be imported in our clinical practice. And in fact, we know that... Uh, uh, even in sporadic YouTube, uh, we end up having uh, more than 10% uh, of patients having uh, alteration of the genes on immunohistochemistry, and more than 5% will end up uh, having uh, germline mutations. Yeah, regarding the MSI, sporadic MSI, we actually have no idea whether it has some prognostic or therapeutic significance, so we won't do anything, no, won't recommend uh, any special treatment for those patients, but immunohistochemistry is really cheap. It's something very easy to do. And there are so much patients that are not diagnosed with genetic disease that I think it's really important that uh, we move that way. Good, so that was the first point. Uh, yeah. What's next? What's next? Uh, maybe I will see if you know the guidelines correctly and ask <laughs> you the, <laughs> the question. Um, so we have made some changes in the risk classification. You obviously know by heart the risk classification for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. We also have a risk classification for uh, UTUC that is triggering different kinds of treatments. Um, what do you think about the, the changes we, we have made this year in the risk classification? Well, risk classification of UTUC has a great, uh, great advantage, which is really, really user-friendly. 
because mm. you have uh, features for low risk and for high risk disease. And you know, low risk is conservative, high risk is nephroyeletrectomy. But there is a problem because today we are moving towards more and more trying to be conservative. And we realize that some risk factors like size with a cutoff of two centimeters mm. or multifocal disease or even hydronephrosis might actually probably be too much to consider per se as a single factor, as an indication of a strong indication of high risk and then nephroterectomy. And we know nowadays with the improvement in conservative treatment, there are people, colleagues that can actually ablate more than two centimeter tumor, as long as it's low grade, of course, or colleagues that can actually ablate multifocal disease. For this reason, we took these three factors also, hydronephrosis, because you can have hydronephrosis because of an invasive tumor, but you can have a low-grade ureteral tumor that causes hydronephrosis. So we took these three factors, and we considered these three factors as weak predictors of high-risk disease. And that means that we leave op more open the possibility to uh, do conservative treatment in selected cases. Of course, we have to be very, very careful about that, but I think... Uh, waiting for having more, more evidence, and we are trying to, to work on uh, revising completely the literature in order probably to change a little bit more this uh, uh, stratification, probably move to have more than just uh, uh, two uh, risk groups, maybe two, three risk groups, like the non muscle invasive of the cancer. But while we are looking for this, I think that uh, this change that has been made uh, is going to, to be an improvement and a help for clinical practice towards, uh, you know, we try to be more conservative in our treatment. Just to be very clear with the people that are listening, uh, you are specifically talking about low-grade high-risk because this is in the high-risk classification. Any of the factors, uh, any of the factor triggers yes. a high-risk classification. So what you are saying is that now if you have a low-grade, high-risk tumor based on the three factors that you said, so multifocality, size, or hydronephrosis, then even if it's high risk, we might consider um, kidney sparing. Because the problem in our uh, classification, which is, as I said, uh, very easy to understand, uh, to remember, a single high-risk mm. uh, high factor is per se able to classify the disease as a high risk. And that's the reason why, you know, of course, high grade is by definition a disease that will always be high risk. But the size, if it's low grade, in the previous classification, if it was more than two centimeters, it just had to lead to consider the disease as high risk. So I think that we have softened this uh, definition and, uh, and this will translate uh, into probably more flexibility in the way we can manage the disease. So this is very important. We are not the only one who have changed the classification. The AUA has worked on it also, uh, producing a rather complex uh, uh, classification with four some groups. Yes, I, I think it is uh, actually a little bit more complex because in the end, they end up having a four-tier yeah. specification uh, with uh, low grade, uh, high grade, uh, subdivided into favorable and unfavorable. And they consider, for instance, the multifocal uh, disease uh, as a uh, low risk, uh, unfavorable, assuming that uh, conservative treatment can be considered. So in the end, uh, we probably move in the same uh, direction but uh, I personally think, and uh, I am pretty sure that you agree on that, Alexandra, that uh, given the low evidence, uh, I don't think there is any point that we try to uh, make such a complex classification. Completely agree to keep it simple for now, and we are in the process of reviewing the literature and maybe uh, moving on a little bit more in the upcoming years. But I think that the major breakthrough in our guidelines this year has been in the treatment of metastatic uh, upper tract urothelial cancer. Many, of course, of the uh, knowledge that we have comes from uh, urothelial, large urothelial cancer se uh, series, where the majority of tumors uh, are uh, actually bladder cancer. 
but I think that uh, many YouTubes were also involved and they enrolled in this, uh, this trial. So what are really the, the major changes that we have uh, witnessed this year? Yeah, so there was a little bit of a rush, actually, at the time of ESMO, because the guidelines were already finished and ready uh, to be printed, and that was uh, the major breakthrough of the announcement of the EV302 uh, trial that showed uh, a major overall survival benefit in urethral cancer metastatic first line compared to cisplatin-based chemotherapy. So we had to review the guidelines very fast. Uh, I think it is the first year that we uh, decided to work with the muscle invasive bladder cancer uh, guidelines panel because uh, the patients, you took and bladder cancer patients are in, being included in the same trials. So it really made sense to work together because we didn't want at the EAU level to have different kind of recommendations in the, in the two different panels. Also, although it's important to pinpoint some spe specificity of YouTube that uh, we might detail a little bit later, but we have completely changed the flowchart for the treatment of uh, metastatic urothelial carcinoma. So, uh, up to this summer, the recommendation for YouTube as well as for bladder were to go on with first-line platinum-based chemotherapy, cisplatin if the patient could, or carbo carboplatin if the patient had uh, impaired renal function, and then go on for um, maintenance or second-line immunotherapy, depending on the, on the response to, to first-line treatment. So this has changed, and now the 2024 recommendation clearly states that if the patient um, is eligible to the ev pembro combination, and if it is available, because this is a major point, for example, in France for now it's not available, but once it will be available, it should be uh, the preferred treatment option first line. If the patient is not eligible to EV pembro combination or if it's not available, the first line treatment uh, still relies on um, platinum based chemotherapy. But we had another trial uh, that was published at ESMO, which is the Checkmate 901, in which there was a benefit of combining nivolumab with uh, cisplatin based chemotherapy. And this is a point where the, the, the readers will find slight differences between the U2 guideline and the muscle invasive bladder cancer guidelines. So in the U2 guidelines, um, we are saying that second line should be based on, um, if patient is not available, um, eligible for EV Pembro, they should go for platinum-based chemotherapy with nivolumab, but with a weak recommendation because only 12% of patients included in this Checkmate 901 study did have upper tract tumor. So this was uh, basically mainly a bladder cancer trial. Yes. Yeah. I think this is, uh, this is really very interesting because also in the Enfortumab uh, uh, plus uh, Pembro trial, uh, there were 30% of patients that were complete responders. So I was wondering how this could uh, actually translate into the fact that uh, we have these patients uh, with a locally advanced uh, disease uh, that are bleeding and we don't know whether to operate or not. But if we will have this kind of uh, complete response, probably we also will reconsider also the way that uh, we do surgery in this patient. What do you think? Yeah, it's going to... Uh, well, the, the results are really extraordinary, very impressive. Uh, there still is a slight difference, again, between you took and bladder, is that uh, in bladder we perform TURBT, uh, talking about local response, but for the local response we have the TURBT, so we are going to get more local response, complete response, locally and on the metastasis in bladder, this I think, possible. than in upper tract, because in upper tract we don't have a, a way to reduce the, the tumor burden. But in the case of having complete responders, we are now, uh, I'm going out of uh, a talk I had recently on oligometastatic uh, bladder cancer and complete response and even sometimes possibility of cure for some of the metastatic patients. So this is a very interesting era. And I also want to pinpoint something very important is that the, in the EV302 trial, the EV Pembro trial, 30% of the patients had u took. So it's a rather large amount of patients with upper tract. And this is the reason why we can make a very strong recommendation toward this treatment first line for upper tract as well as bladder. And while it's different for the um, nivolumab plus cisplatin first line, because the number of UTIC is very small. And we are not mentioning the guidelines, but they did subgroup analysis showing that also in the 
percentage of uh, you took actually that was the 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 survival advantage, which Absolutely. is actually a reduction of the risk of that by fifty percent. Yeah. And uh, finally, I think as the last message, we could also report the news uh, in a later lines treatment because we have the Tor one study that yeah. has shown some uh, hope. Let's say, well, not not too much, but for for patients who are actually failed the first line treatment. Yeah, absolutely. Things are getting very excited, exciting, but they're also getting very complicated for the the reader of the flowchart, because now we are going to have a we are in, in in an era where we have a lot of different treatment possibilities, and depending on what you get in first line, you're going to have different treatment in second line. But for sure, something very important about you took is that you have a high proportion of patients with FGFR3 mutations. And the proportion of FGFR3 mutations is higher in you took than in bladder cancer. So there is a very strong rationale uh, for testing uh, erdafitinib, uh, FGFR3 targeted therapies in you took. And there are some positive results with the thought trial in later line therapy um, for patients who had previous treatment with platinum based chemotherapy and uh, immunotherapy that show um, um, positive results in regarding overall survival. So now we're in a, an era where the patients are going to get, I hope soon, uh, EV Pembro first line, uh, possibly platinum-based chemotherapy uh, second line, or erdafitinib depending on FGFR3 status. And if they didn't get erdafitinib before, then they were having after uh, cisplatin or, plat or carboplatin-based chemo. So we are having more and more treatment, and at some point, uh, we are going to improve a lot, I think, the, the survival of the patients. So all these changes, are really, I think, that uh, are really, have really made our job in uh, yeah. revising the guidelines this year very strong. You, you have done an excellent job. <laughs> and we also have to thank uh, the support of our oncologists, sure. Dr. Alison Birtle, which yeah. has really, really done a great job. Yeah, so absolutely. I think uh, that uh, for this year, that's all. Yeah, and, that's, uh, uh, that's already a lot, I think. So we look forward to uh, the news for 2025. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paolo.